Malcolm Dominey. I'm president of the Federal Society. First of all, thank you all for coming to our event today. I think it'll be a pretty good one. We have a great panel here. We're going to be discussing insurrection, the 14th Amendment, and uh, presidential elections. You can probably guess who this is about. Uh, so our three speakers. First, we have Professor Josh Blackman. Hello. Professor Blackman is a national thought leader on constitutional law and the U.S. Supreme Court. He's testified before Congress and advises lawmakers at both the state and the federal level. He regu regularly appears on news outlets like NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and the BBC, to name a few. He's published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other leading, leading national publications. Professor Blackman has taught here at South Texas since 2012, where he's a centennial chair of constitutional law, as well as being an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, where he used to work, where he used to work. That's right. <laughs> he's authored three books and more than five dozen law review articles that have been cited nearly a thousand times. He was selected by Forbes magazine for 30 under 30 in law and policy. He's also the president of the Harlan Institute and the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the Internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league which if you were at the last event we had with him, you would understand that is the only one. So undefeated, yeah. undefeated, <laughs> pretty easy competition. He blogs at the Bollock Conspiracy and tweets at Josh M. Blackman. He earned his Bachelor of Science from- That's Pennsylvania. enough, you can, it's good, it's good. Okay, <laughs> go on. Then we have Professor Shapiro. Ilya Shapiro is a senior fellow and director of constitutional studies at the Manhattan Institute. He is previously the executive director and senior lecturer at the Georgetown Center for the Constitution, a vice president at the Cato Institute, and director of Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies. He's testified numerous times before Congress and state legislatures and has filed over 500 amicus briefs with the Supreme Court. He regularly lectures on behalf of the Federal Society, which we are grateful for, is a member of the Board of Fellows of the Jewish Policy Center, and has been an adjunct professor at George Mason as well as University of Mississippi. Mr. Shapiro is the author of the upcoming book, Lawless, The Miseducation of America's Future Leaders, as well as books that have already been published, such as Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations, and the Politics of America's Highest Court, as, and Religious Liberties for Corporations, along with a variety of academic, popular, and professional publications. And he regularly provides commentary for various media outlets. Then we have Professor Williams. Professor Williams is a professor here at South Texas, where he teaches a variety of classes, including criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, and capital punishment. He's also taught at the Federal University of, is it Bahia? Bahia. 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 Excuse me. Southwestern Law School, Gonzaga University, Thurgood Marshall School of Law, which is right down the road, and the University of Miami School of Law. He regularly writes books, chapters, and articles on criminal law, including a wonderful book, and I'm not just saying that because I have to read it this semester, entitled Most Deserving of Death, an analysis of the Supreme Court's death penalty jurisprudence. Apart from his academic work, he has served as habeas counsel for eight different death row inmates here in Texas. And like our other speakers, he's a very frequent media presenter, having been interviewed numerous times on local and national TV and radio programs. And with that, I guess we'll take it over to Professor Blackman. Or Professor Shapiro, even uh, better. Shapiro, oh, I'm sorry. Professor right. Emeritus Shapiro, as he says. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is not going to be a uh, completely comprehensive uh, uh, overview of uh, Trump law. Um, former president uh, has got uh, is no stranger to, to the courtroom and to legal process. And there's too much uh, to cover. Uh, but I do want to highlight the, the four pending indictments uh, of him personally uh, and then segue into the case, the ballot access case that will be heard at the Supreme Court next week. So the first indictment that dropped was by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, People versus Trump. This uh, relates to falsifying business records, uh, to pay hush money to a, a porn star, a violation of campaign finance laws that are related to that. Uh, lots of sordid uh, details there. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that this is, and I, I agree that this is, uh, the most politically motivated of one and the, the, the weakest uh, of the indictments against the president and tainted all the subsequent process because this one is, is seen as so uh, flimsy. And if you were following the political common, uh, uh, commentary uh, out of uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, um, the, uh, it, it seems like uh, uh, Trump really consolidated the GOP nomination once Alvin Bragg filed uh, this particular 
uh, indictment. Uh, thus far, um, you know, it's 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 unclear, uh, you know, when when this will go to trial. We're still kind of skirmishing over various things, but that that is hanging out there. Uh, trial is scheduled to start uh, March 25th. Who knows if uh, that'll actually happen? Uh, the next one is a is a more serious one, uh, although tainted by its own things of, of late. The, the state of Georgia versus Trump in state court. That one is in state court in New York. This one's in state court uh, in Georgia. Uh, allegations relating to interference with the count of uh, the Georgia uh, uh, vote in uh, in 2020. Um, conspiracy to commit false statements, solicitation of violation of the oath of a public official. All these things we're familiar with, uh, you know, uh, President Trump's indictment, uh, uh, impe second impeachment that, that came out about making phone calls and and all sorts of things, uh, false statements. So that uh, currently uh, Trump has moved to dismiss on immunity and due process grounds, uh, which the judge has not yet ruled on. Subsequent to that, of course, the DA in Fulton County, Fannie Willis, has gotten in some hot water over <laughs> her erstwhile paramour, who's one of her subordinates. It's just kind you of should a, have had an abstention doctrine and abstinence doctrine. <laughs> That's very good. That's very You're good. Welcome. So anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens uh, there. But th there are definitely plausible <laughs> charges there. I'm not sure about RICO. The Georgia RICO Act, uh, I'm told, is broader than federal RICO. So even that uh, is involved uh, here. Uh, then we have what I consider to be the strongest uh, of all of the indictments. This is the classified documents case in the Southern District of Florida. So now we're moving to federal court. The special prosecutor, Jack Smith, um, uh, you know, uh, misuse, mishandling of various classified documents. This is kind of a, as a lot of things with Donald Trump, I think this is kind of a self-own. Uh, he had been negotiating with the DOJ to, to return these various documents that he had kept, uh, and that fell apart. And eventually, they raided Mar-a-Lago and discovered that he had these documents uh, 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 illegally. I don't know uh, if there's much of a substantive argument. Uh, I think Trump's lawyers on this one are just arguing that it's politically motivated, wouldn't happen otherwise. And by the way, Biden has done the same thing where he has that has those files be beside the Camaro or the Corvette or whichever you know fancy car he has there. Uh, but regardless, this is uh, is delayed pending uh, the scheduling and disposition of Trump's uh, various other trials. And then uh, the one that is probably, you know, threatens the most uh, jail time or punishment or or what have you. And the one that's that's most closely related to the ballot access issues uh, that we'll be talking about for the rest of the event is United States versus Trump, uh, also by special DOJ counsel Jack Smith in the District of D.C., Again, federal court, this relates to federal election interference. Now, importantly, Jack Smith did not charge uh, Trump with insurrection. So, you know, whether Trump did or did not commit insurrection for legal purposes, for federal legal purposes, for constitutional purposes, uh, regardless, he is not being criminally prosecuted for insurrection. He's being, for, there's four charges, four federal charges in DDC, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, conspiracy against rights. This relates to um, uh, the, the, the argument that Trump uh, uh, conspired to overturn the results of the 2020 election, tamper with uh, Vice President Pence's uh, counting of the, of the Electoral College votes uh, and more. Um, this is the first indictment uh, uh, ever against a U.S. president for actions committed while in office. Uh, the other, uh, the other actions. Um, well, I guess the Georgia one as well. This is the first federal indictment. Uh, uh, the others uh, uh, are about his you know, separate uh, dealings. This case is on hold, um, currently stayed while the D.C. Circuit is considering issues of presidential immunity. The argument was three weeks ago. We should have an opinion any moment now. Uh, presumably because the, a, a trial is scheduled in this case, March 4th. That hasn't yet been taken off the calendar. So if the D.C. Circuit does uh, rule that uh, he doesn't have, uh, you know, as, as he tweeted on, on Truth Social, you know, absolute immunity in all caps, uh, and presumably the Supreme Court will not want to wade into that at this point on an interlocutory appeal, then trial could very well start that first week uh, of uh, March. So that brings us to Trump versus Anderson, which the Supreme Court has taken up. Uh, this originated when uh, a group of voters in Colorado uh, went to Colorado State Court uh, saying that uh, uh, under 
under the federal constitution, under the uh, 14th Amendment, Section 3, um, someone who has uh, engaged in insurrection should not be, is not eligible, should be disqualified from the Colorado ballot. And ultimately, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court, uh, after uh, reversals of the lower court, uh, agreed uh, with their uh, argument uh, and threw Trump off the ballot, but stayed that opinion pending a resolution by the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court promptly decided to take up the case with oral arguments scheduled for a week from today, next Thursday. So what are uh, the issues uh, here? There, this is kind of an issue spotting exam. There's a lot on the table. And I have a text on the screen if you need it. Oh, this is very good. Yeah, You're welcome. Focus on the text because that's important. Uh, no person shall be senator, representative, an elector, hold any office under the United States who have been previously taken an oath <laughs> as an officer of the United States uh, to support the Constitution shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion or given aid and comfort to the enemy. Uh, but Congress may rehabilitate, remove such uh, disability. Now, the, it's not just, and I think well, this will be borne out in the Supreme Court argument next week, which now we have live audio streaming, which is amazing. Uh, it means for those, I used to go to like 10 or 12K arguments uh, uh, a year. It's like theater for, for legal nerds, right? Uh, now, except for like the top one or two cases, I just sit at home in my pajamas and I listen to this live audio streaming while I can tweet and do it. It's, it's great. So anyway, you can listen to the argument. Did you once tweet from the lawyer's lounge? I did once tweet from the lawyer's that. lounge and got in trouble for that. Yeah, now, it's, now it doesn't We matter. go way back. Yeah. Oh, was it the Arizona case? I don't even remember. I think it was. I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> I got a talking to from the from the U.S. Marshal. And then they put up a sign saying, you know, you can't have electrical uh, electronic devices. He ruins it for everyone. Lounge. There, there was a closed circuit audio in the lawyer's lounge. Yeah at the Supreme Court. Anyway, now it doesn't matter because it's live streamed anyway. Uh, but, okay, so this, I think we'll see, I'm pretty confident in this prediction, that most of the argument next week will not be about whether Donald Trump committed an insurrection or gave uh, uh, aid or comfort to the enemy, uh, you know, supporting the insurrection, um, because I don't think the court wants to have a ruling uh, on that issue, just for practical purposes. Uh, the goal of the justices here uh, is to uh, extricate the Supreme Court as much as possible from the politics of all this stuff. Uh, and that means if they rule on the most heavily politicized issue, whether he did or did not engage in insurrection for purposes of the 14th Amendment, um, you know, they're going to try to avoid it if they can. And that's why there's all these other issues off ramps for decision. For example, um, there are some standing arguments. I don't think those are really going to be uh, uh, serious, they're, you know, they're voters that are, you know, they probably can be in court to, to challenge someone who's on the ballot. Uh, there's the issue on which Professor Blackman is the leading authority, um, or at least one of the, at least the leading authority for uh, supporting the position of President Trump, whether he is an officer of the United States such that this even applies to him. Uh, in a moment after I go through these things, I'll let Josh uh, make that point. In fact, we will find out tomorrow whether oh, let me let me tell let me tell them. I'll okay, tell them. I'll tell them. Okay. I'll tell them. <laughs> anyway, don't don't ruin my thunder. Right. thunder. Don't steal the thunder. Josh is just a, a a guy who brings the rolling thunder of wherever he comes. Uh, all right. Uh, so whether whether the president's even subject to, to Section Three, uh, whether he's an officer of the United States, whether uh, this provision is self-executing, very serious argument saying yeah, it is what it says, but not all constitutional provisions just apply directly. Congress needs to legislate and have whatever procedures. Should there be a separate hearing? Does there have to be a criminal conviction? What is insurrection for these purposes? Congress has not legislated. Uh, so is, is, is this what lawyers call self-executing? Uh, political question. Is this something for Congress to resolve uh, or the political process otherwise? Not something that judges uh, should be involved in. The due process issue. Uh, maybe President Trump, you know, didn't have there. There was a an evidentiary hearing in the Colorado trial court, uh, but you know, did that give enough process? Should it be more like a criminal defendant having process who's accused of things? Uh, uh, unclear. Definitely a, a significant uh, argument. Um, uh, there's the argument that this is being brought uh, too soon, that this only applies to the general election. It's not yet clear whether President Trump will be on the ballot for the general election. <laughs> Uh, you know, this applies to running for office. It's not about being the nominee of a presidential party. 
you know, the Colorado uh, uh, primary, I, I forget when it is, but when the deadline is for, uh, I think we've passed the time for printing ballots for the Colorado yes. primary. But anyway, this only should apply too soon. It should only apply to the general election. Relatedly, another argument is that this only applies to holding office, not running for office. That is, you can appear on the ballot, you can even be elected, but then you're disqualified. That could be somewhat of a constitutional crisis. But anyway, it's up to Congress to decide at that point, perhaps, uh, what to do with it. But this disqualification is from holding office, not running for office. And my um, my guess, my prediction, uh, which is worth what you're paying for it here, is that the Supreme Court will, A, choose one of these procedural off-ramps uh, and rule for President Trump on them uh, to allow, you know, ultimately the voters to decide uh, his fate. And two, that they'll be unanimous or nearly unanimous in doing so, because that will uh, enhance the Supreme Court's uh, legitimacy as much as possible and you know, remove them from being that uh, decision-making actor. And as Professor Williams, uh, I'll conclude with this, uh, was just remarking to me before we started having this event, it's very interesting, kind of the analysis and predictions of next week's case, uh, Trump versus Anderson, kind of cuts across ideological or party lines. There are people who are uh, Republicans or conservatives who say that uh, Trump uh, 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 should be thrown off uh, uh, the ballot, and that's you know that's what following the rule of law means. Conversely, there are Democrats or liberals or progressives who say he should not be thrown off uh, the ballot. This is kind of more politicized. It's up to the voters. Uh, yeah, he should have been convicted by the Senate in the second impeachment, but that you don't get a, a second bite at the apple in that regard in this kind of judicial process. Um, and by the way, uh, and uh, one other thing I'll just throw on the table before passing it to, to Professor Williams, uh, looming sort of in the background or in addition, in parallel with this Colorado case are other state processes. So just yesterday or two days ago, the Illinois Board of Elections decided not to throw Trump off the ballot there. So again, a very blue state. You can see what, you know, right? California similarly decided not to throw Trump off the ballot. There's process in different states. On the other hand, uh, Maine, the main secretary of state, which is not an elected official, uh, a position, it's appointed by the legislature in Maine there, uh, sua sponte, on her own recognizance, kind of decided to, to issue a 40-page opinion about why Trump is disqualified from the ballot there. Uh, that has gone to a, 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 a Maine state court, which stayed uh, any action there pending what the U.S. Supreme Court does in this Colorado case. And so bunches of secretaries of state, both red and blue state, have called for the Supreme Court to reach the issue of whether this thing is self-executing, whether secretaries of state can act on it. They really would rather not be thrown into that uh, that mess of you know being pressured from both sides in future, not just with Trump, of disqualifying or not uh, uh, various uh, uh, candidates. So interesting dynamic uh, going on there. So I'll I'll stop there. And I'll look forward to hearing Professor Williams. Okay. Do you want me to go first or can Yeah, you can go. Yeah. Because you're, I was oh, right. going to talk about the yeah. criminal case. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it would. Okay. The, okay. Wait, sure. Officer sure. issue. Yeah. Sure. So um, thank you all. I think this is perhaps the, I feel like I'm Trump. All the people with cameras they don't see it. This is probably the biggest trend we've had in a decade. So second biggest. Second biggest? Yeah. Well, it's the well, biggest decade in a long time. So you guys are doing really well. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. um, my thanks to Ilya, my dear old friend, and Ken, my dear colleague, for speaking today. Uh, you know, this is an issue that I've given a lot of thought to. In fact, in some regards, this began at South Texas. Huh? Not the insurrection, but the <laughs> arguments. In 2017, the South Texas Law Review had a symposium on the Foreign Emoluments Clause, the one I helped organize. And I spoke, and my colleague Seth Barrett Tillman spoke. He's a law professor in Ireland. And Seth had been saying since 2008, that this phrase in the Constitution, officer of the United States, office under the United States, this phrase refers to not elected positions, but those who go through the appointments process. Seth has been arguing this long before Trump came on the scene. And he persuaded me about 2012 or 13, I, pers I got persuaded. So when President Trump was elected and became president in 2017, there was litigation about the Foreign Emoluments Clause. That is, Trump was accepting uh, payments from foreign governments. Now, if you have your constitution handy, you'll see. The Foreign Emoluments Clause applies to those who hold office under the United States. In Tillman's view, the president was not office under the United States. So we organized a symposium about this, right? The South Texas Law Review. We published a bunch of papers on this. And that was the first sort of sustained effort looking 
at what this sort of language means in the context of the emoluments clause with an academic symposium. We're very proud of that. And in fact, the brief that I published in the South Lake Floor was cited many, many times, so you're welcome, right? It's good for the journal. <laughs> uh, ultimately, the courts did not agree with us, at least a couple of courts didn't. Uh, there was a judge in Maryland, a judge in D.C. who said, no, Blackman, tell me you guys are wrong. Of course, the foreign emoluments clause applies to the president. Okay, fine. So come 2020 with the election, and Seth and I think, okay, we're done, right? This, this office stuff, no one's going to care anymore. Uh, but then January 6th comes, and on that day, I reckon, I was like, oh, crap. We're back in the game. Because the only way they can get Trump for insurrection is if he took an oath as an offer to the United States. Why? Trump was unique. The only president in American history who's never held government service before. Not a senator, not a representative, not a governor, not a general, right? He had never held any public office before. Maybe served jury duty, I don't know, but no public office. So the only way that Trump can be covered by this provision is if he's taken an oath as an officer of the United States. And Tillman and I have been publishing on this issue for more than a decade. We have an article stacked this high arguing the president does not fall within this provision. He's not officer of the United States. And we wrote an article in 2021, right after January 6th, saying he's not covered by this. We knew this litigation was coming. It wasn't a surprise. We just didn't know when it would hit. So we published our paper. It was there. Trump was sued over the last six to eight months in all these states. And they all say the same thing, that Trump engaged in insurrection, take him off the ballot. Now, this is a primary ballot, not a general election ballot. I don't make much of a difference because whatever happens here, he's going to nominate. And was holding on hope for Nikki. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, it's not. I thought Youngkin was going to be drafted. That's just not, it's not going to happen, right? <laughs> so they were, I've not seen the new Mean Girls the original one, right? Um, I, I, I refuse to watch it. Not, no Ghostbusters, I will not watch the Ghostbusters movie, not going to watch it, refuse to. Anyway, so um, the original is better. They don't miss the perfect thing. Anyway, so look, Trump's going to nominate, so this issue will come up. And so we realize that this will be a big deal. Uh, the Trump lawyers, for better or worse, have adopted almost all of our arguments. Uh, they may not cite us always, which is, you know, a good decision. But if you look at the briefs filed, it, we're, we're front and center. Plagiarism rules don't apply to briefs, by they the way. They don't. They don't. In yeah. fact, we like to be copied. It's actually to our benefit. Uh, Seth and I have also been the leading scholars to write about self-execution. We've argued that Congress needs a statute to enforce Section 3. Then we've argued that this phrase, offers to the United States, refers to appoint positions that go to the appointments process, not the elected president. Now, on January 9th, Can Seth I have an I... interlocutory question? Yeah. Okay, so I think what is arising in the minds of, of most audience members, and this is perhaps the most straightforward challenge to your position, is, is it really the case, as we were like kind of studying this text, every political official in the country seems to be covered. Members of Congress, mm -hmm. uh, cabinet appointed position, as you said, <laughs> members of state legislatures, executive and judicial officers of any state, everyone's covered, yeah. except the president? Yeah. Why would the founders have designed that kind of structure? Or the, 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 the well, enactors it, of the 14th it, it's Amendment? It's a fair question. The reason why is that this was modeled on the Article 6 Oath Clause, <clears throat> right? If you go to Article 6 of your Constitution, flip, flip, flip. It lists a bunch of positions. It lists members of state legislatures, senators, representatives, executive judicial officers of a state or the United States. Let's mention the president there either. And the president's never taken an Article 6 oath. He takes an Article 2 oath. So when you take language from an early version of the Constitution, you bring with it that old soil. And the simple answer to your question, Ilya, is that no one considered this would happen. Just let me spell this out for you. A person became president, had never held office before, engaged in insurrection, and then ran for re-election. Right? That's the fact pattern we're thinking about. I mean, maybe we think about it today, but there's no reason to think about this in 1868. We'd have Abraham Lincoln, who just been assassinated, right? Johnson, right? This is a fact pattern not in their minds. And the text is what controls, not perhaps what they would have accomplished, what they wanted to. Now, let me just move forward. So on January 9th, we filed a brief in the Supreme Court, and we argued why uh, Section 3 requires enforcement legislation, and also why it doesn't apply to Trump because he's not an officer of the United States as president. Uh, I also filed a motion a couple days ago thunder, uh, to participate in oral argument. Uh, might be ruled on soon. We'll see. So if I'm not in class next week, I don't know why. We'll see. 
<laughs> so you can see my motion. It's on the Supreme Court docket. Uh, it's pending now. I ruled on very soon. Uh, but this is an important case. Now, Ilya said he thinks the court will take one of the off ramps. In complete candor, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I've read all the briefing in this case on both sides. I think the briefing on the other side has some strong points. And if it's not framed to the court the right way, I don't know what the court does here. Don't think this is a shoe in for Trump. It, it isn't. If you think that, you're wrong. Uh, this, and, and I, again, I think my side has a stronger argument, but I concede, and always, as a lawyer, always concede the other side has merit. I think the other side has merit. And if the arguments that Trump's lawyers put forward are not sufficient, the court may not rescue him. So the lawyers of Trump have surrendered arguments. They didn't argue whether it was an insurrection. They abandoned it altogether. Right? They more or less abandoned the self-execution point. But they put a lot of weight in what's called the independent state legislature doctrine. The court sort of went out of, out of whack, but that would only apply to Colorado. It would apply to other states. This argument holding office, this off-ramp would mean that until the inauguration, we don't know who the president is, right? All these off-ramps are chaos. Imagine if the court says, well, yeah, Congress, you need to enforce this one. Great. You know what happens? On January 6, 2025, remember January 6, 21? On January 6, 25, Congress might decide, say, you know what? Trump got all the electoral votes. We're not going to count them. He's not eligible. And they'll knock him out at the joint session of Congress. Exactly what <laughs> John Eastman wanted Pence to do <laughs> last time. Congress can do this time. But instead of having, you know, John Eastman, they'll have Michael Ludig advising. Right? This is not a shoe in So unless we get a clean ruling this month before Super Tuesday, when there's still a chance perhaps to pick another nominee, this is going to be Haley's uh, last chance, Haley's Comet, if you will, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> unless we get a clean, you're welcome. Unless we get a clean ruling on this, we're headed to a year of absolute bedlam. So what are the clean rulings? Number one, there was no insurrection. Ain't gonna happen. Uh, the court's not gonna parse thousands of tweets. It's just not gonna happen. Did Trump engage in insurrection? That's the word used, engage. Even if there was an insurrection, was Trump's speech at the cap by, by the White House insurrection? He didn't go to the Capitol. He didn't put on a Viking hat, right? He didn't face paint with, with, with the fur pelt. He did other stuff. But maybe his actions were insufficient to constitute insurrection, to actually engage in it. There's a long shot saying there's a First Amendment argument under the Brandenburg standard. We covered this in class three days ago, right? Um, see, it's all real, right? <laughs> was Trump's speech at the Capitol enough to trigger a lawful incitement of violence, or is it much of a cooling off period? Right? Those are the off ramps. None are very attractive. The only clean off ramp that avoids getting into the weeds of insurrection is what Seth and I have been arguing for over a decade. Because if Trump was never in office for the United States, we're just having an academic discussion. It doesn't matter. Let the court of history decide whether it was an insurrection. That's a, it's a historical question. It's not for the Supreme Court to decide. Um, so I'll be at the court next week anyway. I got I, I got a ticket. So I'll be there one way or the other. I will. Uh, I'll be there on Thursday. Either I'll be <laughs> in the audience section at the podium. To be the TBD. You know uh, uh, that's how it goes. But I, I've been prepping nonstop. As if I'm arguing, so I'm, I'm ready to roll. Um, and he'll be drafting you to do moot courts this weekend, so clear, <laughs> clear your schedule. I would never do that to my students. Um, but again, I want it just to be very clear. This case is not a shoo-in, right? This is not automatic. You know, I, I, Three months ago, I thought, there's no way Trump loses this, right? If you ask me in the summer, like, there's no way he loses this. And I've, I've watched this more carefully than anyone else on planet Earth, maybe with Tillman. And I don't think this is automatic. I, I really don't. So I think a lot depends on how the arguments are framed, what arguments are presented, what arguments are not presented, and whether the court has enough law to get them where they need to go. So the other side has everything they need. They got briefs from everyone. All the smart people in the world are jump side, not so much. <laughs> the briefing is, I mean, look, I can be, I can ask the briefing just on the other side is a lot more heavyweights. I think. I'm the only professor, maybe one or two others, who follow a brief on Trump's side. Um, and look, you think you can win a case in argument? Briefing matters. Briefings where a case is won. Just don't, you have to see, so you can make arguments, but your brief's what matters. And if you don't make an argument in your brief, it, it, it's not an argument. It doesn't matter. 
which is one of the reasons why I saw an argument time because I thought some of the arguments in the brief were not made and that should be made. And that's where we are. All right. Devil's advocate question. Yes, my, my favorite Satan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, as well as I do, because we, we made our names on the Obamacare challenge oh, uh, 12 years ago. I, remember that, I try to forget, but it's very hard. Bring um, my memory. Right. John Roberts conjures up this taxing power yeah, argument, transmogrifies the individual mandate. It's not like there was a lot of briefing on that. Yeah. So what's to stop him or Kavanaugh or whoever wants to, you know, cobble together a supermajority again, they want to reach some sort of supermajority, if not unanimity, uh, to find something, you know, some other off ramp, some other, you know, who knows? Does the, in this case, does the quality of the briefing, the relative quality of the briefing, let alone oral argument, actually matter that much? Well, I mean, as I recall, and, and he doesn't like when I say this, the, the saving construction wasn't made out of nowhere. It actually came from Judge Kavanaugh's circuit court opinion, Seven Sky Beholder. Right, so Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, he didn't make that a whole cloth. It was actually developed by Kavanaugh. On the that was ant the anti-tax injunction I, act piece. I, I know what I'm talking about. And the Solicitor General <laughs> heavily relied on Kavanaugh's opinion for saving construction. That's neither here nor there. But uh, look, there is a range of options which are presented to the court. I mean, can the Chief Justice just make something up that none of us ever thought of before? Possibly. But the saving construction was not at a pulp cloth. There, there, there was history there. I, indeed, dare I, dare I even say, the argument we advance here is almost Roberts-esque. I'll explain why. It's an argument that applies to only one person in American history. Only one person became president with holding, without holding any other office. This would be the proverbial Take a good for one ride. That's it. It disturbs no precedent, consistent with all courts' doctrine, would only apply to one case, say nothing in insurrection. This is the clean off ramp. And if you think saying that something's both a tax and not a tax at the same time, that's crazy. We can say, well, you know what? President Trump's an officer, but not an officer of the United States. I, I see no difference. Um, I can say as much maybe next week. All right. Thank you all. I hope Mr. Professor Williams will give us some other comments, but I'll happy to take your questions afterwards. Okay, so I was going to talk about the uh, criminal cases uh, and why they're important. Uh, actually, it was for a couple of reasons, the criminal cases are important. Um, one is that the polls are showing that uh, if uh, Trump is convicted, that will have a big impact on the election, including with uh, Republicans. And also, I think it would be an interesting question, let's say he was convicted before the GOP nomination, even though he might have wrapped up the nomination, <coughs> might the GOP decide do we want to go into the general election with somebody who has been convicted of a felony? I think that's a real uh, question. So I'm not sure Nikki is necessarily, uh, uh, you know, out of the running uh, uh, in that regard. Um, well, DeSantis has only suspended, not ended his campaign. Uh -oh. Yeah, and Nikki has a lot of money also, so she could actually stay in the race. And there are some suggestions that she will stay in the race because of the criminal uh, cases. So. Very important. Uh, the other reason they're very important is um, whether or not the other really important issue is whether they're actually going to go to trial. Because if they don't go to trial before the election, there's a chance it won't ever go to trial. And the reason uh, being that um, the Department of Justice, re regarding the federal cases, um, Trump could just decide to order his attorney general to dismiss the cases and not prosecute the cases against him. And so they would just disappear if he's elected president. Almost certainly they won't go to trial. Uh, the state cases, he would not have that authority, but the Department of Justice has uh, taken a position when Nixon was president that a sitting president could not be prosecuted while in office. And there are different policy reasons why they took that. But basically, they took the position that that would interfere with the president's uh, duties as president. And so while they're actually in office, they cannot be prosecuted uh, for criminally. And so the two state cases would have to be abated. And so it's very important whether or not the cases actually get to trial before November, well, I guess before January 2025, 20, uh, because they could have a big uh, impact uh, on the election and whether or not they're ever uh, actually uh, prosecuted. So why is there a question whether they will get to a uh, trial? Let me talk about that. Um, and the federal case, the one federal case in uh, D.C., the Jack Smith uh, case that the uh, professor outlined uh, earlier, the election interference case, the issue there is Trump is claiming that he is immune, he has presidential immunity, okay? And usually what happens is that typically um, you cannot appeal an issue before the final judgment. We have a final judgment uh, rule. Immunity is one of the few issues that you can actually uh, appeal before a final judgment because 
if he were forced to go to trial, let's say he, if he did have immunity, which I, I don't think the court's going to rule that way, but let's say a person does have immunity, if they're forced to go to trial before deciding that issue uh, and being able to appeal it, then they're going to lose the right forever. So let's say he were to go to trial and a court later on would say, well, he had immunity, well, he's actually been tried. And so that's why he can uh, file an interlocutory appeal before the case is actually uh, tried and, and you know, there's been a final uh, judgment. So um, that's the hold up with that uh, case. Um, and I do think the D.C. Circuit will rule that he does not have immunity based on the arguments. I did listen to the arguments. And based on the arguments, it sounds like it's pretty clear that the rule that he does not have immunity in this uh, instance. But the big issue there is going to be uh, timing. The case is scheduled for March the 5th. Kind of doubt the case will go. I mean, where's, that's now, what, a month and a half? Or but March uh, 5th. It's, uh, a month. A month. A month. Yeah. Yeah. So I just have a hard time believing, even if they were to rule today, that the case would actually go to trial by March the 5th. Now, and then, of course, Trump would probably try to get a stay or whatever ruling the D.C. Circuit were to uh, issue. And uh, he could ask for a, an involved uh, stay, or he could go to the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court to uh, stay it. Um, I can tell you from my death penalty uh, days, you need five votes on the Supreme Court uh, for a stay. So he'd have to get five justices to uh, agree to stay the whatever ruling the D.C. Circuit. Uh, so it is possible, though, that, that case could go to trial before uh, the election. That is uh, possible depending on the Supreme Court and whether or not they would uh, grant a stay uh, to uh, Trump and decide to take up the uh, case. Uh, the Florida case, uh, there uh, you have the issue of um, the uh, national security issues and also that does seem to be the judge who is uh, malleable to Trump's uh, <laughs> delays, basically. So that case is not likely to go to trial. The other case that's actually likely to go to trial. The Georgia case, as he uh, outlined, the professor outlined, um, almost certainly won't go to trial. In fact, the plan wasn't that it would even go to trial before yeah. the election. Um, I think she was saying September, well, maybe slightly before the election. I think she was looking for a September uh, trial date. But now it's kind of a mess, so it's almost certainly not going to go to trial before uh, the election. The other case that might go to trial before the election, in fact, if I had to bet, I would say that's the one most likely to go to trial is the New York case. Um, uh, he's preparing apparently for a uh, trial. Uh, they have a March trial date. Um, if the election interference case doesn't go, why wouldn't the New York case go before the election? There would be no reason for that one not to. That one would probably have the least impact politically because of the fact that some people do see it as kind of a. You know, Although, uh, imagine out. this again if Bragg's indictment here boosted Trump uh, in the nomination process, in the primary process. Imagine, uh, you know, come end of April or what have you, uh, there's a, a verdict of not guilty, right? Mm. All of a sudden, Trump actually is ex exonerated without any exaggeration, right? Uh, and that fuels, uh, you know, that fuels him even more. So uh, I think it, it could have a, a big political impact, actually. Right, right. If he were to get uh, a not guilty a verdict, now, uh, that's going to be, I think, just I probably uh, DC case, and, um, the um, case of Florida. I think it's going to be very hard to get not guilty a uh, verdict. Now, that doesn't mean that he'll get convicted. You could also have a hung uh, jury. Um, I just have a hard time believing that 12 jurors in New York and also in DC are going to um, find that he's not guilty. Um, but, you know, we're going to see um, what happens. So it's it's also this this issue of, I mean, it could be disposed of on. On on motions, the 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 idea that the, there's a felony falsifying business records, yeah, you have to yeah, prove certain right. things that are you know uh, could could be a judgment as a matter of law. You know these mm -hmm. sorts of things. So yeah, if the case were to be dismissed, obviously that would help uh, Trump. But um, if the case were to not be dismissed, there's a good chance it's actually going to go to trial before the election. That one, I would say, the most likely would be that one. Second most likely would be the Jack Smith uh, election interference case. And I would say the other two are not likely. So we can go ahead and yeah. open up. Yeah, let's take, let's take some questions. So lots, lots of stuff on the table. Sure. Yeah. So what's the likelihood that they would actually let you argue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are they, is, it, is that common? No, it's not. Okay. Very unlikely. It's, well, I should say unlikely. Uh, it, it, the, the course is disfavored.
But uh, it's I, very rare to get argument time as an amicus if you're not a sovereign, if you're not a state or the solicitor general. Who says I'm not a sovereign? <laughs> <laughs> you see the fringes and the flag we want? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, the, the last time that I, I mean, in Citizens United, Mitch McConnell got argument time because he was, you know, the, 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 um, He's heavily involved in, in campaign finance law, but uh, the, 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 that's rare. The, the odds are not in my favor. Um, I would say that, but the, they're higher than they're than higher than average, average, specifically because the arguments in this case have originated with both Seth and me, mm -hmm. and also I don't know that the Trump lawyers have made all the arguments that they could have. And uh, in fact, the Colorado voters filed a motion in opposition to ours, saying we don't need Blackman uh, at the podium. No, of course, that that's that's the right to do. Um, so. Hang it up, draws more attention to us. They could have done, they could have done nothing. Which is scary for them. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I might not understand your argument. Your argument is that the president is not an officer of the United States. Correct. It, that just seems very fringe on the flag. It, you made the joke earlier. It seems extremely fringe on the flag. Oh, we have lots of authority. We have Joseph Story. We have Supreme Court cases saying the president is, I'm sorry, that, that the officer means appointed. Uh, I only had a brief moment, but there's a lot of authority about the appointments clause. Did you say con law yet? Yes, sir. Okay, so you remember all the cases in the appointments clause, right? It says the president shall nominate and appoint, you know, judges, consuls, ambassadors, and officers of the United States, right? And then they're the inferior officers, right? And then the recess appointees, right? Those are the mechanisms by which you become an officer of the United States through the appointment process. The electors elect the president. The word elector means elect. So there's a lot of authority saying that the president is uh, elected. There's a lot of authority saying that these people are appointed. So I don't think it's fringe. What, by, by fringe, I think what you mean is it's uncomfortable, right? This Ilya's question, the intuition is, how could it be that the framers would exempt the president from here? And the fact is, when you use this language, there's case after case in the Supreme Court saying officer of the United States means appointed. There's lots of cases about that. It might not be comfortable that you like it, but that's what the text means. That's what controls. Good question. You have one on the other side. Yeah. Hi, um, Hello. I think this Well, Bush v. Gore was two weeks, I think, or one week. Mm -hmm. And the Nixon case, when the, the Nixon case was played. Like, like, two months, okay. But I guess my question is in regards to people who have voted before this case ends up being solved. Like, what happens to, is there no interest in their votes as citizens? You know, they voted for somebody who was eligible prior to the Supreme Court case, if it ends up being that. If, well, so far his name, I mean, did appear in Iowa and New Hampshire, yeah. is appearing in South Carolina. You know, it hasn't been affected. It hasn't been, he hasn't. Stripped they haven't challenged him in red states, by the way. They've only they've only brought challenges in blue states. So it would basically be he'd be on all the red state ballots. So it's actually even worse than that. And you know, if it's if it's with respect to the general election, you know, the the, the you know. It's not even necessarily that they're going to treat this like a Bush v. Gore case that they have to expedite the opinion. They could hold it until June. Mm -hmm. Oh what God! Michigan? Uh, the what Michigan, the right? The, the, the Michigan Intermediary Court uh, said that Trump should be on the ballot, and the Michigan Supreme Court declined to expedite it, which means we'll decide it in a few months. Which means it, okay. it doesn't matter. So it basically, okay. kicked it off. So for most of us lay people, we just woke up one day and found the news like he had been kicked off the ballot in the. The Secretary of State in Maine had uh, done the same thing. And we also woke up one day and said, oh, Mar-a-Lago got raided. For you all, you have been following this for a while before it happened. What do you all see as another potential method to either put the man in prison or keep him off the ballot that's not in the news, that not, everyone's <laughs> not talking about? Well, the, again, the, the one that no one wants to talk about is January 6th of 2025. Mm -hmm. Again, if the U.S. Supreme Court takes an off-ramp next week, which they could, and they kick it down the road, it might blow up. Again, you know, in football, you have a punt, right? Kick the ball away. Sometimes when you punt, it's blocked and turned for a touchdown, right? So punting is not always a good idea. Sometimes it can backfire. I think whatever the court does, it should resolve it now, 
cleanly. Less is more. Sooner is better than sooner is better than later. Well, I, I agree that they're not. I I think that they're not going to want to decide it in a way that will uh, engender the possibility of it coming back to them. I don't think they want to deal with it ever again. So right, the the, the off ramp that oh it's too soon, come back to us later. I don't think they'll take that one. But but even if you take the self execution argument, that comes back to them in January of two thousand twenty five. It does. It doesn't not. In other words, if you let this fester, and there's a Democratic Congress in January 2025, they're going to disqualify him. Uh, it will happen. They, they will. They will. They, Vice President Kamala Harris will preside over a session that disqualifies Donald Trump. It will happen. After they, he's gained a majority of the electoral college, it, they'll say he was ineligible. Well, that would be that. That would make the mostly peaceful riots of 2020 look like. Uh, <laughs> look, look. Uh, it, it's going to be wild. You mentioned him uh, going to jail. Um, so the case where he's most likely to go to jail if he's convicted would be the D.C. case. Yes. That would be the... Let me also preface that. Um, there's a good chance, that actually, even if he were convicted and sentenced to uh, jail time, there's a very good chance he actually would not go to jail because um, the president is entitled to 24 <laughs> Yeah, Secret Service. <laughs> The well, they have service, to have a special no cell. He might be. They have cells right. for the Secret Service as well. Right. So <laughs> they hold the presidential suite. <laughs> so and the president's of family show ever. <laughs> we have the uh, the Situation Room in, in the, the sub level of the, of the penitentiary. You know. So it's not clear, but uh, there is a possibility of house arrest could be a possibility, but it's not clear he actually would go to jail the way we think about it uh, if he were convicted, and that would. Appeal. So, there's a lot that's going to happen. That has to like happen. an ankle monitor, so we can't leave the White House. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be a reality show. Yeah. <laughs> President, President. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about likely off ramps, um, and you said to so answer your question, it's too political. The poll. Uh, any office is takes a can down the road. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. The office is a kill shot. That wins it. Uh, whether it's on the ballot or hold office. If Trump was never an officer, this is over. No, no, no. That's, so a, that's, separate that's, a, that's a separate one. That's a That's a separate one. Oh, right. holding office. Oh, holding office. Yeah. The holding office. The idea is it doesn't apply to being on the ballot. It only applies to holding office. We have to wait till inauguration day to decide. Right. Right. Not even January 6th. That's inauguration day. Right. Yeah. Self-execution Yeah. The officer... Uh, of the United States is I mean, very technical. Well, no, self-execution doesn't kick the can. Kicks the January sixth because Congress can disqualify. Congress it. could then under pass. the under the Electoral Count Act, the vote's not a regular given. So okay, no, 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 but then, but then Colorado would have to re-disqualify him or something. No, like that. no, 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 no. The Electoral Count Act is a statute yeah. of how the votes are counted, and there's a provision that says if a vote is not quote regularly given, they just don't they just don't count it, right? Uh, okay, but, so if, I, but if they pass legislation, to they already execute, passed it. They already passed it. It's, it's on the books. Electoral Count Act. Well, I know about the like. No, not the Electoral Count Act, but legislation to execute Section Three. If that was passed, you know, whenever it's passed, is it retroactive? Would that be a separate issue? Well, it, they don't need to because they have the ECA. That's that's the legislation. The legislation to enforce Section Three is the ECA. Congress said we are not going to count the votes. Oh, it's there. It's in our brief. It's there. <laughs> it's it's in the last. It's it's in our brief. This argument is there. Members of Congress already said that we have the power to disqualify Trump. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz said it. Uh, Raskin's hinted at that's it. That's a different issue. We have the power to disqualify Trump is different than the self-executing question of Section Three. It, it's the same question. Because that well, that, it is, that is how the Supreme Court rules. If they say if Congress, they, the Supreme Court says it's a political question. It's ultimately just up to a vote by Congress. That's one thing. But whether the Section Three is self-executing is a separate legal question. The, the legislation may already exist. May I think we'll see. And I don't. I don't know that you can appeal from a joint session of Congress to the Supreme Court because again, if you have if you have a Democratic controlled majority on January sixth, they may say we're not going to count Trump's votes. No. And, and then and then who becomes the real president? Mm -hmm. It's true. Who becomes the real president? Now all those questions are moved, right? If Biden wins the election. If Biden wins, then yeah, that's easy. Right. right that, that, that's easy. Uh, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, another question. Oh, oh, you didn't finish your question. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. What's your question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The you know, officer in the United States is maybe technical to be the, the safe textual uh, right. off ramp. Are there any other off ramps that I'm missing that, I have, that we haven't discussed? Uh, the First Amendment is possibly one because I would say that whatever happened January 6th, Trump's speech was protected. 
You could also say that even if there was an insurrection, Trump didn't engage in it. But that requires going through all his tweets and when he called the National Guard and when he didn't. So, again, I mean, Ilya asked me, and I think Ilya is, is, is a very, very shrewd guy. Is there another off ramp? You know, I've been thinking about this pretty carefully. I've read every brief that's ever been filed in this matter. I think I've I've checked off all the points. I mean, one argument is that what the Colorado due process? what due process, but that would only deal with Colorado. That would still allow the issue to linger in other states. Some other state might have more uh, process provided. Yeah. I mean, an another issue that that I've seen is that the Colorado Republican Party might have a first amendment right to associate and pick the candidate. But that's still for the primary, not for the general election. So, so unless you have a merit ruling that either Trump did not engage in insurrection through the First Amendment, or he's not officer of the United States, th th this this goes on. Um, so here's the other thing. If, if, if you're going to bet on this stuff, and I don't think it's on the board of Vegas or anywhere else, but so there's the merits, there's the various procedural things we've talked about, and then there's the field, other things that could come up that, you know, John Roberts clerks could, could find. Uh, I think uh, there's a not insignificant chance that the field prevails. It could also be fractured, right? I think it's very likely that there's like three no, or four no different opinions, no, commanding no actual majority reasoning, opinion, but, but five five stays on the ballot. That's interesting. That's and and I, I mean, in Bush v. Gore, there were many separate opinions, and Justice Ginsburg regretted later that they didn't have more unanimity because they moved so fast. So it's possible that it's just a fractures in so many different ways that you know what the hell the law is, but Trump stays on the ballot. That actually could help if the Supreme Court is thinking about its own legitimacy and all that. If you have unanimous ruling for three different reasons. Bottom line is he stays in the ballot, Bottom line is but, but, they, the ballot. but they fracture, there'd be yeah. three or four different opinions. Seth and I have speculated about that. I mean, look, I, I, I the, the problem is though, if you don't cleanly resolve it, it could still come back, which is why I think you need a clean ruling that he has to be on the ballot on the merits. If it's, you know, three say self-execution, two say political question and whatever, that lets it linger till January 6th of 2025 or inauguration day. Um, and again, I, I think the Congress will, will not be able to resist. And they'll say that, well, the Supreme Court didn't resolve it cleanly. We're going to disqualify him here. That's going to be our job. I mean, look, uh, we still face political risks uh, on, on January 6th, 2025, and inauguration day, yeah. uh, because it looks like the elections, if it's Trump Biden, the election's going to be very close and there's going to be, you know, yeah. claims on both sides. Oh, it's, it's, look, I am not looking forward to the next year um, at all. Uh, it's funny. I teach. I've been teaching con law for a long time. Everything. Wow, this year is the craziest year ever, and that's never true. Every every year after it gets well, gets no, crazier. That, that's not crazier. true. There were, there uh -huh. were years with a lot of big cases. This is this just this sui generis thing. It's you know. Uh, Trump's been Trump's kept me busy the last eight years or so. <laughs> not by choice. I get dragged in like Groundhog Day. Yeah, Hadi. Yeah, oh, maybe someone asked a question. Maybe someone knew. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I know that you said that the Supreme Court is not likely to decide this case based on the meaning of like the insurrection clause. If they were to go that route, like how do you think they would frame the argument around the meaning of insurrection or who gets to decide it? Like can the Colorado Supreme Court decide who has committed an insurrection? It's a really it's a really good question. I'll answer it this way. There is a federal insurrection statute. It was signed to law by President Lincoln before the 14th Amendment was ratified. It doesn't define what insurrection is, right? Whether there's an insurrection, I think it's a question of history to decide. It's a judgment of who, who there, wants. There, there are obviously dueling historians' briefs that have been. No, no, I mean, I mean, differently historians. I mean, when you look back at January 6th, we need more time to assess what happened that day, right? If you look back at the Whiskey Rebellion, these various other uh, instances in American history, we have, we have the, the, the period of, of soberness that this is not us. We just not, this does not affect us personally. I don't think anyone on planet Earth can look at January 6th objectively. It's a day that we all we didn't, didn't live through it. I wasn't there, right? But we saw it. We, we sort of we lived through what happened. And I think whether there's an insurrection, whether there's a is something that we can decide much later. I don't think a judge in Denver can decide that question. I don't think the Colorado Supreme Court can decide it. I don't think the US Supreme Court can decide. It's a hard question on which historians don't agree. And we've had no indictments for insurrection from the federal government. So I, I think that's a very hard issue to rule on one way or the other. Alex. Biden off of the ballot, and that's because of the southern border. And I'm, I'm not sure, like, to what extent those facts are reviewable. Like, they, those, those sound clearly erroneous to me, but I don't know what sort of level. Right. So, if you couldn't hear the question, um, you know, if you look at the text, it says giving aid or comfort to enemies and so on. Uh, it's been argued that President Biden is engaging in violation of Section Three because of his behavior at the border. That he's giving aid and comfort to our enemies who are inv invading the country. You've probably seen this argument. 
I don't put weight in this argument. I'm not going to endorse it here. But look, if you have the opinion that state secretaries of state can unilaterally unilaterally disarm candidates based on novel reads of Section 3, then hold your hold on, buckle your seatbelt, right? Because th 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 this does not end with Donald Trump. You will have Biden take up the ballot in some purple states, which have Republican governors and Republican secretaries of state. And if the Supreme Court says, not for us, we're not going to do this, this will come back. Um, uh, perversely, if you just want to ask, Biden was a senator, so he's covered by Section 3. <laughs> so that, that, that actually wouldn't... That, 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 that's off the table. That, that, that wouldn't help him. Um, but I think the, 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 the bigger issue is um, that what... But he was elected when he was 29. Right. It's actually turned 30 by the time he was. Sworn yeah, in. he actually got sworn in after he uh, uh, turned 30. Um, but if, if the Supreme Court. I think you only get to that sort of mutually assured destruction if the court knocks Trump out. Right. If the court lets Trump on the ballot, I think Biden will be fine. But you go tit for tat real quick if, if Trump gets knocked off the ballot. And the justices are aware of this. I think they are. Right, this, well, again, there's the brief by the secretaries of state. Yeah. Again, I think this is a hard case. I'll, I'll make this point to you very bluntly. This is a difficult case. This is not an obviously easy case. Like with much of Trump, he 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 tests constitutional law and his conduct is such. You have to sort of think about questions that you never thought of before. We've never had to decide this issue about Section 3. It was basically dormant two years after it was enacted. Why? Congress realized, wow, this is a very bad idea to disqualify all these people from office. Let's grant some very broad amnesties because this is too hard to administer. And they realized that so soon after it was enacted that we sit here 100, you know, 50 odd years later trying to enforce it and it's a candidate. Um, this entire effort, I think, was ill-fated from the start. But legally, I think it's a hard case. Yeah, the back. Well, we have an insurrection statute. It's on the books. It's been the books for 160 years. But you're saying something else? Well, yeah, but you just didn't you just say something about how like, it's not practical. Oh, we had to define insurrection in a statute? Yeah. You know, that's a presser. Ken Williams' question, because he's a criminal law professor. I mean, if you were drafting a statute to actually prohibit as a matter of substantive criminal law insurrection, I mean, is that something that, that can be done? I mean, what do you think about that, Ken? Well, yeah, I think you probably could. Uh, there is a statute, a federal statute, uh, yeah. that makes insurrection a crime, so uh, it's already been defined. Well, then, sorry, what were we getting at earlier with how we don't want to use it? Right, right. No, my point was, it says it's a, it's a federal offense um, to talk about in, to, to engage in insurrection. The statute doesn't define what insurrection is, right? There's no model penal code defining what insurrection is. Well, he's, did you say that it does define it? a federal statute, right? It doesn't define what insurrection is, though. It doesn't define it. Yeah. I haven't read it. Yeah, no. It, <laughs> right, it, it, it doesn't define the term, right? Like, when you say what murder is, there's a lot of authority what murder means, okay. right? If you decide what, 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 what battery is, there's a lot of term. But, but, but we've not had a federal insurrection prosecution in a very, very long time. And so it's a lot of this going to have to the prosecutors to charge with. That might be why we don't have any uh, uh, think, insurrection isn't prosecution. Because the focus of the Insurrection Act is that gives the president authority That's to send the National That's Insurrection Act. This, this is different. Well, oh. there is an Insurrection Act which says in the event of insurrection, the president has certain powers to invoke. I'm saying this, the, the, it's which, Title which 18. Issue, which was that issue with Tom Cotton's op-ed that blew yeah. up the New York Times. I'm talking about in Title 18, there's a statute that makes it a crime to engage in insurrection. It's yeah. not, the term's not yeah. defined. But, so isn't it just essentially a lame law? Just, if that's the case of like, if we aren't going to define it, we aren't going to talk about it. Look, Jack Smith can indict a ham sandwich. He has indicted anyone for, for insurrection. Not the Proud Boys, not the Oath Keepers, no one. I think that that's telling. Well, okay, so my question is, like, if it's, if it's so political, if insurrection is such an issue, is so political, and it's like, if it's a political issue, do you think there'll ever be a time where he's no. indicted? I think it's better not to. There are lots of, look, if you were on January 6th and you broke into the Capitol, destruction of property, trespass, unlawful entry, obstruction of official proceedings, there are a lot of easy crimes you can get them on. You don't need to decide whether they tried to overthrow the government. Um, so I was going to ask, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I wanted you to kind of go into it more, maybe if people don't know about the counter argument. So the counter argument that this is originalism at the wrong time. Um, who said that? that? Who, didn't William Bowe say that? 
Yeah. <laughs> the, um, originalism at the wrong time, and that you're pulling the definitions of officer from other parts of the Constitution, but that since this was ah. some time to do that, yeah. will you address that argument? Sure. Everyone? Sure. I mean, so that was actually my article. You still use it against me. Original at the right time. When we're talking about the 14th Amendment, the open frame is actually the 1860s, right? And actually, Ilya and I made this point in a paper we published 15 years ago. That when you're interpreting the privileges or immunities 14 clause, years ago now, yeah. 14 years ago, yeah, it was a little, little nothing. Um, that oh, I was 12. It was amazing. Uh, maybe. <laughs> he hasn't aged much. That when you're interpreting the 14th Amendment, the relevant time frame is actually the 1860s, right? That's what we look at. Um, that works well, but here we have language that was modeled, right? So, for starters, the 13th Amendment, right? He, uh, slavery prohibited. Where did that language come from? It came from the North Ordinance. The due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, where that, I'm sorry, the Fourteenth Amendment, where did it come from? Due process of the Fifth Amendment. The privileges or immunities clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, where did that language come from? Article Four, privileges and immunities. It's well understood that when you take language from an earlier provision and you bring it to a later provision, you bring that meaning with it. You carry with it that old soil, to quote Justice Frankfurter. Um, so, for example, when you're interpreting the privileges or immunities clause, you look to where? Bushrod, Washington, and the Privileges and Immunities Clause. When he was riding circuit riding on a circuit, horse. On a horse. When you're looking at the Due Process Clause of the 15th Amendment, you think about the Due Process Clause of the 5th Amendment. Uh, the 13th Amendment was based on the Northwest Ordinance. We look back. So when the language used in Section 3 is based on the language used in the Constitution of 1788, you look to that earlier provision. It would be unnatural not to. This is a language that everyone studied. Everyone in America knew what the Constitution said. There were cases on what this language meant. Joseph Story wrote about it. It would be shocking for it to have different meaning than this meaning. So this is originalism at the right time and the right place. I just read the um, insurrection, insurrection uh, statute, and you're right. It prohibits um, <laughs> insurrection, but it doesn't define it. No, it does not. I guess you know it when you see it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, someone new who hasn't raised their hand yet? Yeah, right there. So I've heard this argument that it's almost become a necessity to kick off Biden from the ballot so the Supreme Court has breathing room to make an unbiased, unpartisan decision without being it's too late at this goal. point. They're hearing argument next week. Yeah, I think they're stuck. They're, they're in the thick. I mean, look, I, my prayer over the summer was that every state Supreme Court would reject this and the US Supreme Court could just deny cert. And most of them have. That was my, except for the good people in the Mile High City. Uh, was that, well, that was well, that. Maine was a copycat, right? That she she came right after Colorado. But once Maine ruled, it once ensured. Ruled. I'm sorry, you're right. Once Colorado ruled, it ensured the Supreme Court had to. There, there was no out. They had to. They had to resolve this. And the Colorado case, by the way, was four to three. It was close. Yeah. yeah. Had their lawyers flip one more vote, this would be academic. Mm -hmm. I think what's very interesting is that you do, and what makes it unpredictable, as Josh uh, said, is that you've got people on the left and the right. We're taking, I guess, unpredictable positions. So uh, Lawrence Lessing, who's on the left, a professor at uh, Harvard, he takes a position that um, Trump shouldn't be kicked off the ballot. One of the pr pr prime um, motivators of this uh, issue is uh, Judge Ludding, who's a very conservative uh, was, uh, judge. Was. <laughs> He's not very conservative anymore. He, he was at one point. I think he would say yes. I know he would. Yeah. He he, he's, he, he, he called me a moron recently, so uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll reserve judgment. I judge. By the way, it's a it's actually an ethical violation to call yourself judge when you're retired. You can't do that. If you're the ethics folks, when you're retired, you say you're a former judge, you, you can't sign your mills judge. That, that's You're not allowed to do that anymore. Um, that's just, just that, to throw it out there. It's also ungrammatical to call the Solicitor General general. But you're right. Good. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thanks for thanks for being a great audience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.